Mr. Speaker. Senators, I rise today to speak to Senator Seidman's inquiry, calling the attention of the Senate to weaknesses within Canada's long-term care system, which have been exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank Senator Seidman very much for launching this important inquiry. I also want to thank those honourable senators who spoke before me for their analyses of the situation and for sharing their personal experiences with long-term care. I think I should consider myself to be lucky. My parents lived and received care for four years in a non-profit care facility in Peterborough, Ontario, and I feel that they were treated very well. My mom had Alzheimer's, and I have to say that the staff at St. Joseph's did the very best they could with patients suffering from this most difficult and heart-wrenching disease. Both of my parents passed away in 2018, and looking back, I am satisfied with the choices that our family made. I also recognize that others have had an entirely different and terrible experiences with long-term care. I recall, for example, Senator Pate's sad story about instances of abuse at her mother's care home. Whether our personal experiences were positive, negative, or mixed, the fact is that deep systemic flaws exist in Canada's long-term care sector. And while my experiences did not expose the cracks in the system, the cracks were there in 2018, and the cracks have been there for far longer. According to journalist Andre Picard, over 150 task forces, inquiries, and commissions conducted since Medicare was introduced have documented the sorry state of long-term care in this country. As Picard says in a quote, one can't help but be struck by how the same problems are exposed and the same solutions are suggested time and time again, end quote. As the title of this inquiry suggests, COVID has indeed exposed the system's weaknesses with catastrophic results and has washed over the system not once but twice. After the first wave, we learned from the National Institute of Aging that 77% of deaths across Canada from COVID occurred in long-term care and retirement homes, including 80% of Quebec's deaths and 73% of Ontario's. A report from the Canadian Institute for Health Information released this past March found that the situation did not improve overall for the sector in the second wave. In Manitoba, a series of outbreaks at long-term care homes, some of them chronicled by Senator Bovey in her speech to this inquiry, resulted in 480 deaths during the second wave, up from three deaths in the first. In Alberta, the second wave brought more than 1,000 deaths in long-term care, and British Columbia followed the same pattern. In Ontario, a recent commission on long-term care found that government inaction meant that the virus gained another foothold in long-term care homes and resulted in a second wave that was far more deadly than the first. <clears throat> the commission's report found that the elderly died at an alarming rate in Ontario this past winter. At one home, 118 of their 119 residents tested positive resulting in 34 deaths. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ontario's second wave killed a total of 3,758 3, residents in long-term care homes, up from just over 2,000 during the first wave. Nationally, Canada lost more than 15,000 long-term care residents since the pandemic began. <clears throat> As of this spring, according to the Canadian Institute of Health Information, deaths in long-term care homes re represented close to 69% of overall fatalities in Canada, which was the worst record among wealthy countries and 28% higher than the international average. <clears throat> It is a great shame that even after the calls for urgent action during the first wave, the second wave still caught our long-term care sector 
woefully unprepared. And colleagues, we would have to conclude that had it not been for the timely distribution of vaccines in long-term care facilities this year, the sector would have suffered a third time during the third wave. <clears throat> the pandemic highlighted in red the underlying long-standing and systemic issues in Canada's long-term care sector. These include underfunding, weak government oversight, limited data collection and information sharing, profit-oriented decision-making, overcrowding, aging infrastructure, and underpaid, undertrained, and overworked staff. This workforce that is mostly women, many of whom are racialized and many of whom are new Canadians. To fix our systems, we need higher standards for elder care. And to achieve this, governments need to increase their funding and they need to regulate more. Let's, let me start with those higher standards. Experts in the field, including Dr. Pat Armstrong of York University in Toronto and others, have identified a number of conditions in the long-term care sector that must be changed. These include expanding access to quality long-term care for all Canadians, not just the most affluent, establish establishing enforceable minimum staffing levels, as well as staff employment and retention policies, dramatically improving the conditions of work in the, in the sector, addressing physical environments, including things like PPE, waste removal, room size, and ventilation, improving education and training for paid staff, as well as volunteers, and establishing strong, enforceable reporting mechanisms rooted in data collection and transparency. When it comes to funding, the system, the federal government has indeed made several commitments. Last September, the government announced $740 million for long-term care in its Safe Restart Agreement. They announced the Safe Long-Term Care Fund in the Fall Economic Statement, which set out $1 billion to be distributed over two years and half of that funding was delivered via C-14 when it passed uh, earlier last month. Finally, they announced an additional $3 billion in budget 2021 that will roll out over five years. And many provincial governments have also committed more spending on long-term care, which of course is a provincial jurisdiction. Ontario, for example, has promised $2.7 billion for new long-term care beds and $2 billion annually to hire new personal support workers. So let's acknowledge that more funding has been put on the table. And Canadians are also on side when it comes to more spending. An abacus poll of Canadians conducted last year in May 2020, about three months into the pandemic, found that 78% of Canadians supported increased funding for long-term care. But it's also essential that higher standards be set. Government need, uh, governments need to create better standards in the sector through better and more effective regulation in a sector which is currently already highly regulated. Several experts in long-term care have called for national standards, which would be implemented by the federal government in return for federal dollars. We heard this from several witnesses appearing bef before the Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs um, in the committee's review of the federal response to COVID last year. For example, Dr. Réjean Hébert, former Quebec health minister, testifying at the committee last June the 10th, explained the necessity of federal legislation which would create such standards. This, in his view, would give the federal government legitimacy to assist the provinces to implement services and to assist in responding to crises like COVID. Quote, giving money is not enough, he added. 
national standards might be implemented via amendments to the Canada Health Act or through a new piece of legislation which would follow the structure of the CHA but focus specifically on long-term care. Yet another way to achieve national standards is through a policy framework built by a regulator or by a health standards organization, which would be linked to federal dollars that are accessible to the provinces, to those provinces that demonstrate compliance and progress toward those goals. And finally, the federal government could, in fact, scrap the concept of national standards altogether, but still make bilateral agreements with the provinces to improve conditions, as they did in the Safe Start Agreement last fall. These are all the ways for the federal government to assist the provinces to fix the sector by way of the federal spending power. Now, colleagues, make no mistake, the federal government has put national standards front and center in their messaging on this topic to date. National standards have been promised in last year's speech from the throne and in this year's budget with a strategy that appears to involve the Canadian Standards Association and the Health Standards Organization who presumably will build a set of national standards which the government will seek to implement with the provinces in return for federal dollars. The budget further stipulates that funding is to, quote, help Health Canada support provinces and territories in ensuring standards for long-term care are applied and permanent changes are made, end of quote. In this federal system of ours, imposing federal standards on the provinces, even with substantial federal dollars, is especially challenging. As Finance Minister Freeland stated here in our chamber last October, and I quote, to have standards that work for the community, for the country, to have standards that have real buy-in from all levels of government is going to require a real process of discussion and negotiation between the provinces, territories, and the federal government, end quote. Whichever way you look at it, whether it is national standards, consistent standards, or better standards, there is much work left to do. In conclusion, colleagues, the problems of our long-term care systems are well documented and the solutions are well understood. Canadians support more spending and they want better standards. We have lost too many of our family, friends, neighbours and fellow citizens due to inaction. I say to our federal and, provi and provincial governments, let's get it done. Thank you, merci, miigwech.